Well, first of all, let me put it like this. I'm Jen, I'm Christian, and I'm gay. Where in the Bible is the word homosexuality? And you could be looking forever because it's not there. From Genesis to Revelation. It's not there. The word homosexual is not in the Bible. People think it is, but it isn't. Hello everyone. This is Lanria in love of the Atom Proud African LGBTI YouTube channel. This afternoon we are at South East London, precisely. We are in Charlton. We are visiting our own senior deacon, Jen Ferguson. She's a senior deacon of the Metropolitan Community Church, North London. Good afternoon, Jen. Good afternoon, Lanry. How have you been? I've been okay. Um, good days, bad days, but more good days than bad days. Glad to hear more And good now days. that COVID's on its way out, Ooh. <laughs> hopefully we can continue some semblance of normal life very soon. Hopefully. So. It's our pleasure having you on our channel this afternoon. It's a pleasure having you in my little house. <laughs> Jen is a senior deacon at the Metropolitan Community Church, North London. She is a teacher, apart from being a servant of God, she is a LGBT and human rights defender. It's our pleasure having you on our channel. Thank you. Who is Deacon Jen? Lanry, I think I've been asking myself that question for 70 years. Wow. Who is Jen? <laughs> because life just evolves and you start in one place and you visit so many places in your life. Um, Jen is a person who's done many things employment wise but to go back to the beginning I was actually born and bred in Yorkshire where I spent the first 12 years of my life and then my mother and my brother moved down to London and I finished a term at school and then I followed them. So I began London life in Hendon, then Northolt, then Ryslip, and then back to Northolt. Right. And then because I was a naughty girl, I had a choice between um, a remand school or a boarding school. Right. So I chose a boarding school and it turned my life around. Interesting. And from there, I managed to get my A-levels and got into what was then, in 1969, Digby Stewart College, which is now the University of Roehampton. Right. And I completed a teaching degree and went into teaching. People don't believe me when they say, what, what subject did you teach? All right. I said, I taught everything because I taught four to seven year olds and I loved it. And it was great because the greatest responsibility I had then was knowing that what I was teaching them and how I was treating them and educating them was like a keystone in the, for their future. You're right. So I enjoyed that for many years and then I had to retire um, with a medical problem and I then went into catering and eventually owned my own restaurant in Balham. I had this wonderful little cafe before Balham on Tooting Common. And it was a shell of a building when it was given to me uh, by the guy who owned it. And he said, can you open this place, please, and run it? It became um, very well known in the area. And the wonderful thing about it was that people who would normally ignore each other in the street or even cross the road because either you were the wrong colour or the wrong sex or the wrong sexuality or whatever, they had to sit together. It was such a small place and it became an amazing little community. So I did that for five years and then 
as I said, I owned my own restaurant in Ballam. And then that became too much because I was doing seven days a week. Wow. So I then swapped and went into fostering, which is also seven days a week. And I did that for a few years with um, Reverend Shannon. And from there, I got a job with Bernardo's. And I was a project manager uh, recruiting ordinary everyday people like yourself and Abby, cameraman Abby, um, <laughs> to be volunteers, to be mentors to young people in care. When I got to 67, I decided it's about time I put my feet up. But in the meantime, in mid 90s, I became aware of Metropolitan Community Church All right. in <clears throat> South London. And that's where I began my, if you like, stay with MCC. And I was with MCC South London for quite some years. Um, my partner at the time was uh, Reverend Shannon Ferguson. And people are very curious as to why we have the same name. When well, 2000, I'm sure Reverend Shannon won't mind me sharing this. In the year 2000, she decided that Ferguson was a much stronger surname than the one she had. So she changed her name, her so surname, to mine. Ferguson. And refuses to change it back, which is good. Because there'll always be a Ferguson now, you see. And then Reverend Shannon decided, um, she was just standing in the shower one day and said to me, Jen, I think God is calling me. So I just looked at her and said, well, I think you better answer. And uh, they did. And they became ordained. They did their training in MCC North London. All right. So at the time, Shannon was in North London and I was still in South London. And my Sunday would consist of going to North London and covering the afternoon service that we used to have. Yeah. Then I would leave that service, go over to Ballam, do the evening service, leave that service, go back to Camden, pick up Reverend Shannon, and then go back home. And after, I think, uh, about a year, it just became a little bit too much. Okay. So I left South London. I transferred my membership from South London Church to MCC North London. Camden. Camden. And I've been there far too long. That's how I got involved with MCC North London. North London. Thank you for that. Okay. So my observation is that African LGBT immigrants, we have uh, so many of them as members of the Metropolitan Community Church. Why is this? Abby knows part of the answer. Many years, I think it was somewhere around 2011, 2012. I, ca I can't never ever remember, uh, you know, on the spot and I believe it was Abby, went to a meeting of the lesbian and gay Christian movement. Right. And at the time, Reverend Shannon was the CEO and they attended a meeting. And I believe Reverend Shannon mentioned MCC Church in North London. But I think at the time they were either the assistant pastor or they were the pastor. And I think the following Sunday or maybe a Sunday later, Edwin and Abby came to MCC North London. Apparently they liked what they saw and what they heard, um, especially like the preaching and the, <coughs> the affirmation of a God of love, not a God of hate, yeah. not a God of anger, um, and took the message back. And the following week, there were a couple more, and the following week, there were a couple more, uh, and it just literally snowballed to a point that I think there were a couple of Sundays where there were quite a few Sundays where we had to open up the balcony. Yeah, no. But, you know, when, when you say to Tim, who, who was always on the door uh, in the evenings, and you say to Tim, how many tonight, Tim? 120, Jen. Oh, my <laughs> God, where did we put them all? And it was, at the time, it, the church was, oh, it was buzzing. It was so alive. 
and you could feel um, you, you, the, the way people felt and looked so comfortable. You could actually feel it. And so many of them eventually, even sometimes after a short time, so many would come up to me and say, I feel as if I've come home. Yeah. And that was just like, wow. Mm. That's really good. It was, it, and it still is. That's really good. People still say that, I feel as if I've come home. I can relate to that. Good. Being a member of MCCNL myself. Where did activism of fighting for the um, rights of the LGBT, especially the African asylum seekers, where did that energy come from? Don't look at me like that. <laughs> from God. <laughs> Lanre, that, that's a difficult question to answer really because it just happened. Um, I was in church one Sunday and, and this is back in 2012, um, somebody came up to me and said, um, Jen, is it possible for you to write a support letter for me? And of course I get this gormless look on my face, oh what? <laughs> what do you want a support letter for? Well, because I've got this interview and I have to prove that I'm lesbian or I'm homosexual. I went, what? And that was where I saw the beginning of what is not a comfortable, nice process that, that LGBT Africans have to go through. It, it's, it, it, oh, I, I don't want to talk about that bit. Um, and it just... It just happened. I wrote the letter at the time. I had to write it on ordinary paper. Okay. So basically it was just that I knew the person, they'd been coming to church. Um, and we talked we, you know, about many things. They'd, they'd been strong enough to divulge their background in whether it's Uganda or Ghana or Cameroon. Um, and that's how it started. And then after a few letters, I then was asked, I believe in 2013, would I go and be a witness at an appeal? Oh Lord, what have I let myself in for? <laughs> um, and I, I can't, when it comes to other people needing help, I, uh, no is not in my vocabulary. So I said yes, I had no idea what I was going to do, what I was going to say, what was going to happen. And I don't think I've ever been so terrified in my life. And it's just snowballed from there. And I believe, and I get asked this every time I go to court, have I ever said no to anybody? And yes, I have. I've said no to a couple of people. Okay. Uh, because I... I didn't believe them. They came in the church, they put their bum on a seat, they sat there for six months. They didn't, you know, they drank the tea, ate the biscuits. They didn't engage with anybody. They didn't do, offer to do anything. Um, and I just thought, no, you're using this church. <laughs> and they got the shock of their life when I said no. Yeah. No, I need to know you better. You haven't even said hello to me, you know, on a Sunday. And lo and behold, they never came back. They never came they back. They never came back. Hmm. So yes, I, it, it was in my vocabulary on a couple of occasions, but, and excuse the phrase, but what you people have been through is unbelievable. And the thing that has spurred me on was, and it took a couple of years, I, I'm a slow learner, Okay, but what spurred me on was, I, it dawned on me one day, it was like a, what they call an epiphany moment, the light bulb went on. And I just realized I had never had to go through what many of you go through. A, in your life, in your own country, because you're gay. And then the process that you have to go through when you come here. And all you're doing is seeking refuge. All you're doing is seeking safety. And I thought, I've never, ever had to fight for my freedom. Yeah, I've had a couple of 
you know, homophobic attacks in my life. I've been called names. But never have I gone through anything like what you, have, what you as a community have gone through. Mm. And from that point, I made it a promise that I would never give up this work for as long as I've got breath in my body. <laughs> and I will never, ever take my freedom for granted again. Mm. I, it was a gift given to me and I took it for granted for so many years. You know, I was okay. I could hold the, my partner's hand in the street. We could put our arms around each other. I could kiss them hello on the lips in public. Yeah. Could you in Nigeria? It's not possible. No, it's not. Then what is possible for me should be possible for every other human being or every other LGBT human being. You're absolutely right. The Metropolitan Community Church North London has been like a training ground for its members. Uh, the teachings, <clears throat> I introduced you as a teacher earlier. So before asking about the immigrants that have metamorphosized into leaders in the church, I want to ask you, being called oftentimes for representation in the courts. How do you manage all these? Lanre, to be honest, I, I don't know where the energy comes from. I mean, the only answer I can give you is somehow God gives me the time to do it. Hallelujah. And it's, yeah, it, somehow everything just fits into place. And okay, when I was, I hope this isn't, nobody from Bernardo sees this, but they had um, a way that you could work from home. And basically I always planned a court hearing on the day I was working from home. Okay. So in the morning I'd go flying off to Taylor House or Hatton Cross and I'd come back in the afternoon and then start my day's work. So, and then I forgot that actually they knew I was working late because of the time on my email. Right. But I didn't think of that at the time. I, everything just seemed to fit into place. All the, the church things, the, the um, you know, the Sundays, whatever, they, I just lived for Sundays. I just loved going to church. And I just love being part of that family. Yeah. Because we are one huge family. What, what, what's your reaction to it? When you see um, an asylum seeker who's been granted, stay, who's been protected, and they come back into the church, taking up leadership roles, what goes through your mind when you see such? You know, I've got examples like, uh, uh, members like Osei, Monique, when they come back and, you know, what goes through your mind when you see such individuals, such, such members? Well, basically, if they didn't come back, they would be terrified of me. <laughs> no, joke, joking aside, that was a joke. Oh, yeah, that was a joke. I understand. It's, it's wonderful to see, because if you like, it's their way of saying thank you, not to me, to the church. church. Because it's not I, the church supports me and gives me the, the energy and the strength to go and do what I do. Um, and it's wonderful that these people come back and again, and, and contribute to the church and take some of the load off. Because we're a very small, if you like, clergy team with a, a lot of work to do, and they somehow lightened the load. And the thing about um, the majority, they are, they're so reliable. They make a commitment, they stick to it. And that amazes me um, in this day and age, but I'm so grateful for them. Being a gamer from Nigeria, I want to serve in the church, but I have reservations with respect to certain verses in the Holy Bible uh, with respect to homosexuality. 
how would you advise? How would you counsel me? To start with, I would give you a Bible. I will appreciate that. And I will show you, I will ask you to show me where in the Bible is the word homosexual? Where in the Bible is the word homosexuality? And you could be looking forever because it's not there. From Genesis to Revelation. It's not there. The word homosexual is not in the Bible. People think it is, but it isn't. Hmm. What I would say to you is to come into the church. I mean, when people first come into the church, I don't bother them. I say hello, I smile, um, you know, I'll introduce myself, and then I leave them. And I will not bother them, I will say hello and whatever for a few weeks, and then I will start to get to know them. When I see that they're getting more and more comfortable within the church, so again, I would give you time to get your feet in the door and to connect with other people in the church, other members of the congregation. Yeah. And they are the best people to make you feel comfortable and welcome. You're right. And they do a brilliant job. And then probably we would start chatting. And I'm a very practical person. I can't, it, it's what I was saying a couple of Sundays ago when I preached. I don't believe in this fluffy, woolly Jesus, you know, who's an absolute saint. Jesus was a human being with the same emotions that you and I have, the whole run-of-the-mill emotions. And I would actually say to you, listen how we talk about God and how we talk about Jesus in this church. Have you ever heard any of us rant and rave about God being a God of anger, being a God of wrath when we preach? Have you ever heard any of us say that we are God's mistake? We are an abomination? You won't ever, ever hear that. All you will hear in MCC churches is you are a child of God and you are a beloved child of God. To go back to the verses, what I believe what has happened here, and this is my opinion, those verses that you talk about, especially Leviticus, they have been taken out of context. The background to when they were written has never been explained to you. Look at it this way, you have you have the book of Leviticus, right? Yep. Now, there were 12 tribes of Israel in the desert. So there must have been a hell of a lot of people. You had the tribe of Levi. The tribe of Levi were, met, were commissioned to be, if you like, the high priests. That's all they did. They were the priests, the high priests, the low priests, the in-between priests. They ruled the, the priestly, religious side of things. Okay. So, this is where you get the Leviticus, because it was written by the Levites. You've got, I mean, I put it very practically, you've got thousands of people wandering around for years in the desert. How do you keep control? How would you keep control if you were in charge of thousands of people in the desert? So you make up all these different laws. And one of them says, thou shalt not lie with a man as with a woman. What is not said is, part of this was the fact that many times the Israelites had turned away from God and had taken on other religions and their um, whatever they do, and a lot of it was debauchery, a lot of it was making idols and worshipping idols. So what you have now 
is somebody saying, you can't lie with a man as with a woman. But this is what they did in these other cults. That is what Leviticus is trying to say, don't do it. Just because they did it, don't you do it. don't do it. Look at the rest of the laws that were made up. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, um, you're wearing clothing of two different materials. Well, I'm sorry, that makes you an abomination. You know, um, Abby's sitting over there and he's shaved. He's an abomination. You know, I, I, I remember preaching on, on this passage in church one Sunday and I went round several people in the church and I got to Reverend Shannon and they had a shaved head and I called them a prostitute because under the law in Leviticus for a woman to show her hair, never mind shave her head, cut her hair, <laughs> she was a prostitute. So you have all these rules and regulations just to control people. And it's the same with, if you look at St. Paul. St. Paul, before his conversion, worked for the Romans. He saw what the Romans did. You know, the men would take young boys. Even the women would take young boys or young girls and sleep with them. That was all part of how they lived. And Paul is just saying, don't do this. Because it's coming from an, a point of control, where is the love? There is no love in it. No. You know, if you go out tomorrow and um, sleep with somebody and there's no love in it, okay, I'm not here to judge. As long as it's consensual. You have to believe in a God of love. I cannot believe in the God of the Old Testament. I love the Old Testament. I mean, it's like, um, it's got every tragedy. It's like EastEnders, Coronation Street and Emmerdale all rolled into one. All the tragedies and all the, you know, the happenings, the incest and whatever. Yeah. It's a fantastic read. But I don't believe in this God of wrath. I cannot love an angry God. I can only love a God of love because that is the God, that, that's what God gave me, was the ability to love. To love. I'm not a mistake. Neither are you. Neither is any LGBTQI, no matter how many, how long you want to make the acronym. We are all loved. God is not going to waste his time making mistakes. It's not a God of mystery. No, not at all. <laughs> no way. Oh dear. We're the best thing God ever created. Ever. <laughs> and I don't just mean LGBT people. I, I mean, you know, everybody. You're right, Jen. You, you, the catch, I'm afraid, I think with being a Christian, is love one another as I have loved you. Love your God with all your heart. But it also says, love your enemies. And that is the hardest thing. You know, when you've been persecuted, when you've had to flee your country, when you've had to leave family behind. You know, so many things about the, 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 the community in the church, the, the, the African um, community in the church, again, not only made me appreciate my freedom, but it was also, you know, the, the people that have lost people back in Uganda. And it actually breaks my heart to think, you can't go back. If you lose somebody in Nigeria, you can't go back. No. And that must be so hard. And that's the sort of thing that I want to see gone. Mm. You know, these chains, you know, you've got your freedom, you've got your status, but it comes with a price. We've got uh, some of our members 
uh, sending in their questions to you, Jen. I hope you are prepared to answer those questions. No. Uh, <laughs> um, the first question is from Elume. It's, for, it's a gay man from Cameroon. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Elume Ebu, a gay guy from Cameroon. I just want to take this opportunity to thank Mr. Abe for the great opportunity of asking questions and also our able coach, Mr. Idris. And also to thank uh, Reverend Jane of MCC of coming to uh, of taking her time to answer our questions. So my first question is, how should Christian treat homosexual identified men and women? And the second one is, can a gay person become a Christian and make heaven? And as a preacher of the gospel, what is your stake on homosexuality? Thank you so much. How should Christians treat gay men and women? That's his first question. His second question... Oh, let's, let's see them one at a time. Okay, okay. Because... all right. How should... Christians treat gay men and women yes. the same as they treat straight men and women. Okay. Your sexuality does not, um, should not influence how somebody treats you. Okay. The fact that you are heterosexual or homosexual is neither here nor that is personal choice. You treat gay people as, as the, the gentleman says, exactly the same way as you would treat um, somebody who is straight. What, what's, your sexuality should not enter it. It doesn't enter into the equation. I'm going to treat you, Lanry, and you're a gay man, exactly the same way as I would treat the husband of my friend next door, who's straight. You are both God's children, you are equal in all aspects. Yes, it's a simple answer to that. <laughs> Sorry. Um, if, the, if the gay man has a, uh, wants to become a Christian, let's say they have no faith, okay? They've grown up without faith. Yeah. But they want to become a Christian, then yes, you start your journey. Becoming a Christian is going to be Again, depending on the church you go to, um, it, it's going to be a positive experience. Okay. If you come to an MCC church, it will definitely be an, a, a positive experience. Mm. And whether you're gay, straight, Christian, Buddhist, Jewish, whatever, we're all going to heaven. Simple. Amen. And the last question from Elume. He had a lot of questions. He, he did that on the last but not the least. He, he wants to know your own opinion as a preacher. What's your opinion about homosexuality? Well, first of all, let me put it like this. I'm Jen, I'm Christian, and I'm gay. In that order. Mm. Who I am matters. My faith matters. My sexuality matters because that's put all three together and that's who I am. As a preacher, as a teacher, I support LGBT, the LGBT community. I always have and I always will because I have been a lesbian all my life. I've got, you know, men, men friends that I love dearly and I'm so glad they're in my life. But it has never entered my head, A, to have a relationship with a man or to have children. I love teaching them because I loved sending them home at the end of the day. I didn't have to take them home with me. As a preacher, everybody is equal. In God's eyes, everybody is equal. We might be different race, different color, different sex, um, all sorts of differences. But that's because we are unique. And each individual is unique. I mean, if the world, if we were all the same, my God, the world would be so boring. 
it's the fact that people are different that makes the world exciting, colourful, different. Um, the LGBT community in Africa, as you're aware, uh, in Ghana, for instance, um, 21 members of the LGBT community were locked up. They were recently granted bail. We don't know what uh, is going to become of them. Uh, in Uganda, 44 members of the LGBT were rounded up and only God knows um, what their fates are now. Cameroon, Nigeria. How do you think the LGBT community will overcome these humongous challenges back home in Africa? I think one way to go is to educate people about the, the, the situation for LGBT people in Africa. It's not good. And when I say educate, often when I was in court, I was surprised at the ignorance of the Home Office representative on the lifestyle of, of different African countries or different, um, you know, in Uganda. How many times did I hear a, a Home Office person say, oh yes, well you can be sent back and you'll be safe. You can go to a different part. Uh, and I'm sitting there thinking that is the worst thing that could happen. Because I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I think in Uganda there's 45 different tribes who've got their own mother tongue. I'm going to get this wrong, but I, I'm not apologising. Let's say you come from the northern part of Uganda. Your skin tone could be lighter than somebody who lives in the southern part of Uganda. The same with east and west. So if you... Let's say you lived in the north when you, before you fled Uganda. If you are sent back to the south, you're not going to know their language. Okay, you may know English, but you're not going to know their language, their mother tongue. You're going to be a different colour. There are going to be, and you go to a village or, or even a small town, and people are nosy. Oh, you're new. Who are you? Where have you been? And then they, they inform the chief of, of the, the area. Yeah. <laughs> you're called up. Oh, where have you been and what have you been doing? And what are you going to do? You're going to say, well, actually, I've been sent back from the UK because, uh, because I lost my appeal because I'm a lesbian. I think you'd be dead in 24 hours. Of course. Somebody needs to educate people about how different life is in the LGBT community in Africa, in India, in Bangladesh, wherever, in Russia. It's got to be education. And then people have got to get together and they've got to make a big enough noise so that people are heard. Look at the noise Black Lives Matter. Yeah. It took a man to die in horrendous circumstances and then you had Black Lives Matter. Well, I'm not going to die, you know, to, to, uh, I'm not going to become a martyr, but I want to become an educator. People need to know, people need to get together. And for a start, they need to educate this bloody government who rules the Home Office. Yeah. And if the Home Office knew, if they knew, if they had just studied country of origin. It's not rocket science. Google it. How many times I've said to a judge when they've said, well, how do you know all this? I googled it, sir. <laughs> oh dear. That's a starting point. Education. Education is always a starting point. Education. Yeah. I, before allowing you to enjoy your evening, I know there is this project that uh, you and um, Metropolitan Community Church North London are, are supporting mm -hmm. uh, the cold weather, the cold weather shelter shelter project. 
Yes. Do you, do you want to shed oh, Lord, a little very bit quickly. of light on that? Um, the Cold Weather Shelter Project is run by... Um, oh, it's not a company. It is run by a charity called C4WS. Okay. And I can't ever remember what the logo stands for. <laughs> but it's churches combined in Camden. Various churches. Weather Shelter. Yeah. There are seven churches, and each church takes one night of the week okay. into the next morning right. to house guests, normally up to 16 guests, okay. in the church, and the guests come in, they sleep in the church, they have dinner, they, we talk to them, they shower, um, they sleep. People, a couple of volunteers stay overnight. The volunteers in the evening get everything ready, the beds, the food, whatever. Then uh, a couple of volunteers stay overnight to keep the guests safe. And then they have a breakfast in the morning. And then they go out for the day onto the street. Normally they do have some appointments to go to. Okay. And then they'll go to the next church. Right. And that goes on from the beginning of November to the end of March. Now, sadly, because of COVID, this year the whole thing was just screwed up. The coronavirus pandemic lockdown had come with lots of challenges. Mm -hmm. But for the body of Christ, MCCNL started the virtual service. What has been the experience? I just thank God for it. I thank God for technology. Hallelujah. Because how else would we have been able to, to keep together? And the other one little side is that we have um, other people have come in not that didn't belong, that weren't members of the congregation yeah. to start with. And now we've got a few new members not members officially, yeah. uh, but they, and they're enjoying it and they're loving it and they're saying, oh, it's refreshing. Mm. Again, because we're not banging on about this God of wrath and we're an abomination. <laughs> no, we're a bloody miracle. We are. And, but we're still, even when we go back into church, we are still going to go on Zooming the services it's, it's for the people it's, it's that live too hybrid, far away. Hybrid, hybrid yes. service. Yeah. If you have any message for the African LGBTI community here in the UK, back home in Africa, in Europe, wherever they are. I think my only message is to listen to your heart, to listen to that little voice inside you that says, yes, I am loved. Yes, I am God's child. Yes, I have the right to be here. Yes, I have the right to be me. I have the right to own the freedom to be me. And I would say to you, never give up on that dream. Never give up on the dream that one day you will be free. You will be a community that is honored. You will become a community that is a necessary part of every other human being's day-to-day -day living. So if you don't stay strong, if you don't go on fighting, then I'm gonna come and find you. And you will answer to me <laughs> in the nicest possible way. Just please don't give up. Go on fighting. Thank you very much, Jen. The message from Jen this evening is that keep fighting, don't give up. And initially she's told us that our God is God of love and we are equal before that God. There should be no discrimination against the LGBT community anywhere in the world. This is still Art and Proud African LGBTI YouTube channel. Thank you for watching. We've been spending this evening with Senior Deacon 
Jen Ferguson of the Metropolitan Community Church, North London. It's been nice tapping into her wealth of knowledge. This is Larry Aila. Keep watching. Please keep commenting. Subscribe. Your messages will be responded to within 10 minutes. And turn on the notification button so that you can have more interesting videos from us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jen. For You're welcome. Us this evening.